Thank you, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be with you. I'm mindful that my position in the program is to stand between you and the global imperative of the imminent Indian buffet. Uh, and that is a dangerous position to be in. I thought that to start, uh, I'd first like to thank uh, the hosts uh, here, uh, these wonderful institutions here in Bangalore, as well as Yale and Pomona, but special thanks to both Brian and David uh, for inviting me uh, and my extraordinary colleagues from CMC to be a part uh, of this uh, great conference. I thought um, I would start, if the video is uh, ready, uh, by letting our students speak uh, for themselves. Uh, we talk about student centricity, uh, so I thought we would let uh, the medium be the message in this case. And this is a, a short video we prepared of our uh, students of Indian origin who are at CMC talking about uh, their experiences. So I'm going to let them be the stars at this point. So. Congratulations. I'm Virginia, 10th year student of Indian College. I'm a senior. I'm a dual major in biology. I'm in math and economic dual. International relations. Economics and psychology. I'm an economic science major. When Adam Miller from the admissions department came to my high school, I talked about CMC. I realized that it was the perfect fit for me. I chose to attend a liberal arts college because I have interests in more than one subject. I definitely needed the chance to explore a lot of different courses coming in as a freshman before I was able to declare my major. So. CMC gave me the chance to explore and to become well-rounded. A liberal arts education has mainly broadened my perspective. Before, I would just think as I would think as an economist at one point, and at the other point, I would think as a science student. But coming to a liberal arts, I can think of a situation not just accept that it's happening, but think why it's happening from very different perspectives all at once. I used to think before I came to college that to work at a company like Google, you would have to be a computer science major. I'm neither a computer science nor a sort of engineering major, but I ended up working at Google for two summers, and it was like a very eye-opening experience, and I totally account for that because of my liberal arts background. The liberal arts education really promotes problem-solving skills just because we end up in a lot of seminar classes. Whenever the professor was challenging my beliefs, we had to understand the material to be able to give a strong argument. Liberal arts is one of the best tools you can get um, in problem solving. Uh, the reason I say that is because traditionally they would build specific skill sets. I would learn how to read financial statements. I would learn how to think about Roman history. But what liberal arts does, it, it really eases your fluidity and moving across those skill sets and applying all of them or more than one of them at once and attacking the problem with, with a broad perspective. They also encourage you to work in teams and groups and have presentations, so then you figure out your strengths and your weaknesses as a team member, as a team leader, and how you can delegate tasks. Most of your classes, your freshman or your sophomore year, first year or second year of college, you'll end up probably not being with people who are going to major in the same things. By default, your collaborative skills and your ability to like think outside the box is just exponentially increased. There's a lot of different things to love about CMC. The best thing here is the environment. People here are so friendly. Everyone says hi, just walking in the hallways. My favorite thing about CMC is the Kravis Leadership Institute. The professors there working at the institute, traveling with them. The opportunities that have come to me, a lot of it has been through the leadership development at Kravis Leadership Institute. My favorite thing about CMC would definitely be the Athenaeum. The fact that I can sit down with authors like Jim Lahri or have a conversation with Condoleezza Rice. The degrees of separation between me and like my idols is just cut short by, by a lot. The most fun experience at CMC was my first night at CMC. They have something called the Freshman Surprise. So the whole college does something for the freshmen, so everyone's together, everyone's in North Quad. I'm just gonna leave it there, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I think the most fun experience I've had is competing on the Model UN team. CMC gave me the opportunity to travel to Vancouver, travel to Melbourne, to compete on an international level. My most fun experience has definitely been my first funding. 
So fonding is when on your birthday you get thrown into a fountain. Something that happened this year, we have a new president, President Sadash, and uh, it was his birthday and he was the first president to be ever ponded and I was present for that. It was exciting, it was fun, it was welcoming for him. The five colleges or the five C's being together in the consortium is an excellent idea. You get to take classes in other campuses, you get to meet people from different colleges. Some of my closest friends uh, go to Pomona and Scripps. One thing that I really liked about having five small liberal arts colleges here close together was that I could take advantage of the resources at all of the five C's. So I was able to take classes at the other colleges, um, and it's, very, it's a very seamless integration. Having five colleges as opposed to one really, really enhanced my education. Um, the main reason being, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I first came to Claremont. And that's an option you can have when you come to CMC. You do not have to know this is exactly what I need to do, but the doors are always open for you to have a wide variety of things that you can choose to do. The amount of opportunities that CMC has given us, it's just unique. The sponsored internships, the study abroad, the research opportunities. I mean, we have so many research institutes and it's not something that you can start only in your junior or senior year. As, in, as a freshman, you can start working at these research institutes. For stu Indian students in particular who are looking at liberal arts, Arts, I would suggest, um, first of all, do it. Highly recommend liberal arts. Take classes which you initially thought are not your focus or not your main interest, because there's so many interesting things that I've learned from my religious studies class or from my philosophy class, which I thought I would never be interested in. So the main piece of advice I would give to Indian students is I think it's easy to get caught in the stigma of you must have a pre-professional degree when you come out of India and I think that's something that's very highly valued um, and there's a good reason why it's highly valued like you would want to have an engineering degree you would want to have a medical degree or a business degree um, but what sets you apart from being an engineer or from being a math major is having that liberal arts background right so you're not limiting yourself when you come to the Claremont colleges especially CMC by saying oh, I'm not letting myself pursue a pre-professional path. If anything, you're enhancing the pre-professional path. So I think that would be my main piece of advice um, to people who are considering, who are not considering a liberal arts education. To those who are, I'd say, go for it. I think it's the best thing that's happened to me, for sure. So we're all proud of our institutions and we're all extremely proud of our students. I thought what I would do today is to bridge from the particular to the global. Uh, yes, we all live and work in a particular context and I wanted to start by describing some of my own context. Uh, I've spent 20 years in higher education. Uh, this is my first six months in a liberal arts college. Uh, I spent. 13 years in a Research One private university at Case Western. I spent seven years in a Research One public university. And later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as a great deal of convergence in the different models, uh, the different modalities uh, of education that we have in the US. You heard some wonderful presentations this morning from uh, our colleagues in the UC state system that could have been given. Uh, in many ways uh, at the very best liberal arts colleges. Uh, and also, as you probably know, a lot of liberal arts colleges are doing the kind of research that is done in R1 environments and also incorporating skills training and real experience and what we call experiential learning, a phrase I, I use myself. I've never really liked it because of the negative pregnant in it. It, it, it almost suggests that every other form of learning is non-experiential learning. Never quite got that. Uh, but you can see the kind of convergence in these institutional presentations. Having said that, uh, I also wanted to just express how inspired and also discomforted I always am by these kinds of conferences. Um, it reminds me of a great story from my own tradition, one that was uh, told at my wedding. I'm married to a woman who's originally from Maharashtra and we had essentially uh, a Hindu wedding in two acts. We had a Hindu ceremony followed by a Jewish ceremony. And the rabbi um, told a wonderful story about a poor Polish man in a little shtetl in uh, his village. Uh, and he had a dream one night. He woke up from this dream and said, I must travel to this city in Vienna. 
And his wife says, well, why would you want to do that? He says, well, I had this image in my dream of a bridge guarded by a soldier. And under that bridge was a pot of gold. And somehow he convinced his wife to let him uh, gather up some belongings and take off on a long journey. Days later, uh, bleary-eyed from hunger and dehydration, he arrives at some city. And there's the bridge. And there's the soldier from his dream. And as he approaches the young Austrian soldier, the soldier then all of a sudden uh, expresses great surprise at seeing this man, this poor Polish Jew, who had emerged in his own dream uh, several days earlier. And the soldier said to him, you'll, you'll never uh, believe this, but several nights ago I had a dream that I was in your uh, little cabin and underneath your stove uh, there was a pot of gold. Now, there are two lessons uh, that are often, well, there are two lessons from this story. One is much more conventional than the other. The conventional lesson, of course, is that we need not look beyond the parameters of our own lives to find the treasures within. This is, uh, in some ways, the sensibility that Laurie expressed yesterday of looking internally for, for those roots that, that can be nourished to give blossom to the uh, institutions, the processes, the environments that we want to sustain our next generation. But there's a second lesson, a less conventional one, which is had the poor Polish man never had the dream and had he never taken the risk of pursuing it, the first lesson would have been lost. And so I tell you that because for me this process of comparison is always one of both uh, going out and looking for the essence of liberal arts, not, not the words, as we heard yesterday, but the essence. And by looking out, rediscovering, uh, and discovering the treasures within, the lessons that, that we know we have. And in some ways, it's a metaphor for all of education, because uh, as David said, we have all of us hidden talents that sometimes we're extremely insecure about. And, this, the, the process of a great mentor and a great educator is to draw out uh, those, those newfound securities from the context of that insecurity so that we can find that we're smarter and more compassionate and more courageous and have a greater sense of direction than perhaps we thought we had when we entered uh, this kind of mentoring relationship. So I realize I have, uh, again, a, a three-hour claim and, and just a few minutes to make it. So let me. Let me give you the, the gist of the claim, and again, I apologize for the broad brush strokes that I'm going to articulate. But let's set all of this in a global context. Uh, we know long before Thomas Friedman's flat world that we live in an era of globalization. The intensification of cross-border exchange, of capital, services, uh, information, and goods. But we also know that as we pave the road across borders uh, that along with goods come bads. Uh, environmental harms, uh, violence, organized crime, corruption, and other things that disrupt communities. Now, I don't know whether to be optimistic or pessimistic about globalization. A uh, Soviet philosopher once said that everyone's an optimist, it's just that pessimists have more information. Uh, and uh, the Soviets are particularly uh, adept at, at, at the anecdote uh, when it comes to uh, such deep philosophical matters. Uh, but I do know that we're all committed to raising the level of the water in the glass. And the question is, how do we surmount the challenges and how do we seize the opportunities? Uh, we know that we have great challenges of energy, natural resource depletion, and yet we see exciting new technologies. Uh, we know that there are disruptions of our manufacturing base, but then there's 3D printing. We know that we have, uh, on the one hand, a tremendous revolution of information technology, but on the other, we have cyber crime and cyber insecurity. And I could go on. And to me, the one thing that our ability to surmount the challenges and to seize the opportunities depends on is the quality of our mind and behavior. Uh, Bobby Jones, the great golfer, once said that the hardest golf course in the world was the six inches between your two ears. And I think 
every challenge that we face, we could say the same thing, that yes, it's a severe challenge. We have to deal with physical, economic, political forces far beyond our control, but the real challenge is internal to our own brains, our nervous systems, our emotional capacities. And so with that premise, uh, this places enormous challenge on our educational system as well as our educational culture. And I think that higher education has a very important role to play. Yes, higher education, even elite uh, institutions in higher education can never match, can never meet the massive scale of educational needs in the society. There's, there's just no possibility for higher education to do that. However, by establishing that standard, that aspiration to which the entire society, if not the civilization, can extend itself, higher education has a very important role to play. And I believe that when we think about those special qualities of mind and behavior, that the liberal arts have not an exclusive role to play, but a very central role to play in the production of those capacities. What are those capacities? Well, I think beyond content, beyond talking about liberal arts as a residential campus, beyond the internships, beyond the international programs, I think increasingly we have to set our eyes on the true challenge. How do we produce the capacities over a lifetime in the next generation of our students that again can meet the imperatives of our age? How do we do it? And what are they? Now, I've started with the hypothesis of roughly six capacities, and I've boiled those down a little bit more. But many of you have talked about them, critical thinking. I would add to critical thinking a notion of methodology. That is, it can, it's not just to be critical, but to have an understanding of the underlying assumptions and processes that give rise to a certain position, belief, insight. Creativity actually comes from that deeper understanding, a second capacity. We talk about communication. To me, collaboration is its twin. And we also talk about cross-cultural understanding. But I think cross-cultural understanding is really, in some ways, too narrow. We must have cross-understanding of whatever difference, whatever otherness, whether it's a religious, economic, political partition that separates us. We must have the ability to get beyond that partition to absorb and synthesize back into our own identities. And then finally, we have the question of ethical character. What I've done just rhetorically is to articulate these as three, creativity, the empathy for collaboration, and the courage to make ethical decisions, to make calculated risks in entrepreneurship or in politics to take a group from A to B, to speak truth to power. And I think it's these three capacities that we should have our eye just absolutely laser beam focused on when we're talking about the liberal arts. Now, I just wanted to conclude with a couple of additional perspectives. One is what I mentioned in the beginning, is convergence. We shouldn't create a little box over here for liberal arts and research one and professional education. And CMC is a great example of taking a page out of the Research One playbook by establishing research institutes in 1969. Now we have 11 of them. By taking the leadership mission and incorporating the idea that experience teaches, as well as the classroom. We also have to think beyond institutions to the internalization of an ethos for liberal arts. This is what I mean. John Monet, the architect of the European Union once said that every new idea is a bad idea until it has an institution. But it's also true that if we equate a good idea with an institution, we sometimes lose track of the idea and its value. And ultimately what we're after is not the growth and success of the institution, but the growth and success of those that the institution serves or serves indirectly by its example. Third, through this ethos, we then have an urge to recreate 
that ethos, to share that, to convey that to others. I used to say, my whole life I've been trying to relive my undergraduate experience, to reanimate it. And that's one, perhaps one reason why I've spent 20 years in, in higher education, is to recreate, to rediscover that learning process and experience that I experienced as an undergrad. To look at a blank page of paper, to look at five Euclidean postulates and create a new theorem, then to get rid of the fifth and create a non-Euclidean theorem. To study language not just for global conversation, but suddenly the verb conjugates differently, the verb conjugates at the end, the, word, the, the language is an inflective, all of a sudden it's not letters but an ideograph, and how powerful a lesson that provides to all of us by challenging the assumptions of what we believe to be the way things are, by disrupting that and then becoming very creative with that. And finally, I think that we have to not only teach liberal arts, but in our academic leadership, we have to be liberal arts. We have to animate the liberal arts. And that means that we have to critically think about our assumptions. What do we really know about the link between our intervention and the results in a particular student or a group of students? How can we be more creative? How can we communicate better the value proposition of liberal arts in a more affirmative way? How can we collaborate more when we're so focused on our own institutional settings? How can we get beyond those differences that keep us apart? And finally, how can we exhibit the courage to take those very measured and calculated risks? Now I know when we think about the world, when we think about India, when we think about the United States where I believe our educational system and culture is failing, it's very overwhelming. And I leave you only with this thought from Lu Xun, who was a Chinese author during the very rocky Republican period between the two world wars. Lu Xun said, when confronting desperation, we have hope. Hope, he said, cannot be said to exist or not exist. It's like a road on the earth. At first, there are no roads. But when many people travel in one direction, a road is made. And I think that's what we're doing here, is we are traveling arm in arm in one direction. And thank you for paving the way for us and uh, for allowing us the opportunity to, to join you in this. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you for that very interesting talk. Uh, I was interested when you were using that sort of structural permutation of otherness. Uh, the way in which different intellectual disciplines shore up and confront otherness. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious if you think that all forms of otherness are actually assimilable and analyzable. And if not, do you think that there are othernesses and forms of otherness that are insuperable? And if they are insuperable, what do you think the role of the university is in confronting otherness? So. I'm agnostic as to the answer, but I have a certain impulse, and I'll just lay it out on the table. And I'll express it this way. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about the nature of comparison in the heat of my academic career. And I was always uh, troubled by this refrain, it's apples and oranges. I said, well, you know, the refrain is, oh, it's incomparable. You can't compare these things. They're too unique. It's apples and oranges. Well, I can compare apples and oranges. And I think the refrain or the, the contested refrain, objection, apples and oranges, is itself uh, highly problematic if you think about it. I can compare apples and oranges. I can, I can choose them when I want a snack. If I want to have, uh, I have land and I want to grow something, I can decide which one to grow. If I'm going to bake something, I can bake it on this question of taste and nutritional content and liquidity and so forth. And when you think about it, it's also a paradoxical objection because what has the person done? They've compared apples and oranges to another comparison, which itself is arguably less comparable than apples and oranges itself. And I could go on. So I start with the impulse that everything is comparable. I'm not saying it's equatable. I'm not saying that you can necessarily translate otherness into some sort of 
common denominator of understanding. But the failure to try, the failure to try then would suspend the ability to find that something was truly incomparable. And so I think before internalizing the defeatism or fatalism of making that attempt, I think we have to make that effort. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions. One relates to this Jewish parable that, that, um, that you mentioned. And I was kind of waiting at the end of the story for, the quest for, for an answer to the question, so did the, the <laughs> Viennese and the Jew, did they go, just go back to their <laughs> respective pots of gold or did they continue with, uh, <laughs> did they fulfill the dream and go to one another? It's open to your own uh, okay. projection this of may, the answer. This may depend on, um, the story does stop there. So. Okay. <laughs> this also may depend on you know historical <laughs> relevance. Um, and the other thing is when you when you mention critical thinking as um, something that is somehow separate or um, or is in a rift with methodology. Um, I don't know if that's how if that's how it's really being utilized during the conference. I know there are some differences here, but. My concept of critical thinking incorporates, without a doubt, methodology. I didn't mean to suggest that it didn't. In fact, okay. what I tried to say, and I, maybe I was inarticulate about it, is that when people say critical thinking to me, I'm not exactly sure what they mean. And um, let me pause there just to reflect with a personal anecdote. When I, when I started college, I was probably viewed as very critically minded. My brother, my oldest brother, gave me a gift, and it was a stamp and it had a little red blotter, and it was all capital letters spelling wrong. And I love that stamp, man. I used to, when I read stuff that I didn't like, I'd take that stamp out and I would stamp it, and it gave me a sense of empowerment. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I matured through that to understand that, yeah, sure, you, we all get frustrated by things, but ultimately we have to empathically look at what underlies that particular expression or idea or position and to try to understand the methodology that produces it and to challenge it at its roots as well as its expression, but to do it in a humble, in an intellectually humble way that also by reverse projection casts self-criticism on us and the assumptions that we carry. And there were certain experiences that I had in a liberal arts context that helped me think about that. Uh, not all in the classroom, some in the performing arts. Uh, I studied West African dance. I studied Russian drama in the mother tongue. And that taught me something about getting outside of myself or what I viewed as those closed parameters of my own existence. Yes, Parker. Hi, it was a wonderful talk. I thought that at the end you said something about U.S. educational system having failed. Yeah. And I was just a little surprised. I mean, we hear that about the schools, the high schools and so on. I think it's actually oversimplified about the high schools too. There's a problem with the high schools and the elementary schools. It's failing in lots of parts of the U.S., but it doesn't fail universally. But I just saw the wonderful talks about Pomona and the two UC schools and then what you, you've been doing. And it strikes me that these are great success stories, even though I know that UC is under a lot of economic pressure and even elite institutions feel some of this economic pressure. Um, surely, I'm, you know, I'll just say so everybody doesn't think I'm thumping the American chest that I'm Canadian born and I came to the US partly because of the excellent educational system. I've worked 20 years there. And uh, so I just wonder what you mean by yeah. saying that the, certainly the higher education system, it seems to me that it hasn't failed, or maybe there are things that it can't make up for that are in society and equities and so on, but that's not necessarily a failure of the higher education system, it's a failure of society, perhaps. I was, in my mind, and I should have been more expressive about this, and perhaps a bit more qualified um, and less crude in that statement, that I was really thinking about our primary education system, less so our higher education system. I actually think that the higher education system in the U.S. is one of the lasting comparative advantages that we do have in the U.S. Um, I do think that there is some significant trouble in that system, however, and so perhaps we could just rehearse a couple of observations. One is 
that beyond the institutions that we've been hearing from today, um, you can go to a very good public university and some private universities where the attrition rate is appalling. And I, I taught at the University of Utah, which is a really fine institution, 54, 55% uh, graduate within six years. University of Minnesota, not that much better. Uh, I think we should all be troubled by that. And as far as our primary education system is concerned, I'm not one to blame the system, but to put much of the emphasis on what I believe is an, a failing educational culture. Uh, I don't think we're producing as many school-proof kids as we should. And when I think about the kids that I know, who are high performing, uh, I'm not so convinced that it was the schools that made them high performing. And so I think we have to take a very candid look at that as a culture. Now within the successful elements, we all know about rising costs, about at times a failure to articulate to the broader society a convincing set of values, and third, the question of accountability for the value that we think we're projecting all great challenges that I think we're facing, how to moderate costs, provide full access, how to make sure that we are constantly innovating and improving the value of what we're doing in ways that many in this room are doing, but also that we're expressing that in a way that is truly accountable to the broader society. So uh, I didn't mean to suggest that we're all complete failures, but I think that we have to acknowledge the serious challenges that we have within the US educational system.